special creation. So come take a look. Give me the hook or the ovation. It's my world, and I want to take a little pride in my world, and it's not a place I have to hide in. which is faith adjacent. Many of our college students are faith adjacent, recognizing that they're perhaps institutionally skeptical of the ways in which their own experiences of their creator and the divine and love match up with institutions. And we got a good reason why perhaps people are faith adjacent, because at those moments there was a shooting in Florida. We've seen that people are offering their thoughts and prayers, and some people are wanting to see policy and change. And this is leading to an inevitable conflict between not only being skeptical of institutions, but also skeptical of our neighbors. And though there may be reasons to be skeptical of our institutions, when we are skeptical of one another, it's not doing any of us any good. And so our Christian students yesterday who wore signs of the cross on their forehead with ashes, began to hear the words of the prophet Isaiah who said, when you stop pointing your finger, and you instead extend your hand, then you will be called a restorer of the streets and a repairer of the breach. I think there are some times that words of scripture begin to speak to our hearts and our experiences. There are other times where they do sound like thoughts and prayers and well-worn phrases. 
And so it was yesterday with some humility and a great risk that I introduced students to a term that I know, which is Chance the Bennett. Students will know him as Chance the Rapper. <laughs> I said that Chance the Rapper is also institutionally skeptical. When he accepted the Best New Artist Award, he began to talk about his hometown of Chicago and the problems it has. And he began talking about that inescapable network of neutrality that Martin Luther King Jr. talked about. He said that violence is inevitably linked to schools. And schools are linked to corrupt politicians. And corrupt politicians are linked to policies. And policies are linked to banks, and so on and so forth. And I began to wonder if perhaps he begins to speak in ways to us, or perhaps at least our students will begin to understand things. Chance, the rapper, gave an interview in which he was asked by Peter Sagal on National Public Radio, how do you write a rap? And I want to give you perhaps an insight into that, because I wonder if the ways in which he says he writes a rap are the ways in which we also practice spirituality. He says there's a lot of premeditation to it. You have to sit down. You have to focus. You have to concentrate on your breathing. You want to do a good workout. Maybe you do some push-ups. Maybe you do some sit-ups. Maybe you play some cards. You think about your taxes. You think about all the people you know that you've met in this life and in the past life, if you believe in that sort of thing. And then you take off your socks and your shoes. And you put a pencil between your toes and you start writing. Hear that loud and clear. What Chance is saying is that you can't write about something you haven't experienced yourself. The basis of all of our spiritual teachers begin to say that you have to use your toes, you have to use your feet in the ways in which you have walked and done different things. Sometimes I use raps, I call them poems, and sometimes I call poems prayers as guides for each one of us. One of my favorites that I've been using most recently is by Elizabeth Alexander. She wrote it for Barack Obama's inauguration in 2008. It's called Praise Song for the Day. I lift up Praise Song for the Day, a day after Ash Wednesday, a day after a mass shooting, and a day of celebration in which we thank all of those who have gone before us for the contributions they are using to make this world a better place, not only with their hearts and their hands, but also literally with their feet. Each day we go about our business, walking past each other, catching each other's eyes or not, about to speak or speaking. All about us is noise, all about us is noise and ramble, thorn and din, each one of our ancestors is on our tongues. Someone is stitching up a hem. Someone is darning a hole in a uniform, patching a tire, repairing things in need of repair. Someone is trying to make music somewhere with a pair of wooden spoons on an oil drum with a cello, a boombox, a harmonica, or a voice. A woman and her son wait for the bus. A farmer can see the changing sky. A teacher says, take out your pencils and begin. We encounter each other in words. Words spiny or smooth, whispered or declaimed, words to consider or reconsider. We cross dirt roads and highways that mark the will of someone and others, and I say that's what's on the other side. I know there's something better down the road. We need to find a place where we are safe. And so we walk into that place in which we cannot see. Say it plain. Many have died for this day. Sing the names of the dead who brought us here, who laid the train tracks, who raised the bridges, who picked the cotton and the lettuce, who built brick by brick, the glittering edifices that we would keep clean and work inside of. Praise song for the struggle. Praise song for the day. Praise song for every hand-lettered sign that figuring it out on kitchen tables. Some live by, love thy neighbor as thyself. Others, first do no harm, or take no more than you need. But what if the mightiest word is love? Love beyond marital, filial, national. Love beats that east and west widening pool of life. Love that needs no need to pre-inject grievance. In today's sharp sparkle, in the winter air, anything can be made, any sentence begun, on the brink, on the brim, on the cusp, praise song for walking forward in that light. 
At the end of Chance's accepted speech for Best New Artist, he said, in addition to all the problems, I know that I can't fix them if I don't first become a better father and a better cousin and a better person, and change begins with me. Friends, I invite each one of us to take pencils between our toes and love between our hands and to begin with us and to begin to extend our hands and our hearts outward in thoughts and prayers and policy and change. We give thanks for those who use their hearts and their hands to begin to create this world as a better place. Thank you so much for your contributions. We look forward to hearing them more in detail. It's my pleasure now to introduce the Vice President of Intercultural and Internationalization in Campus Affairs, Dr. Ruta Shaw Gordon. Thank you, Reverend Malzahn. That was beautiful and really helps us to kind of frame today to think about that change does begin with each of us. Tonight, we, I would like to welcome you to the 12th Annual MLK Agent of Change Ceremony, where we honor the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. while recognizing the good works of all of those in our community. When you think of the words of agent of change, I oftentimes think of someone who has a clear vision, someone with lots of patience, persistence, the ability to ask tough questions, someone who's knowledgeable, someone who leads by example, and someone who has strong relationships that are built with trust. And tonight, at this ceremony, you are going to hear, and we're going to honor, three amazing people from our community who exemplify all of those qualities that I just said. A faculty member, Dr. Jonathan Blaze, a student, junior biology member Kayla Teal, and an alum from the class of 1987, Deputy Chief Keith Stiff. Let's begin by acknowledging their hard work. And we are so excited to be able to hear from Dr. Nell Braxton Gibson. We are very honored that she is here with us tonight to share her journey and her story. So let's give her a round of applause. And we can't forget that we began this night with a beautiful and memorable performance by Travis Harley. Thanks, Travis. Of I Am What I Am. And that selection allows us to challenge ourselves and others to see who we truly are, and as Dr. King would have said, the content of our character. And so, thank you, Travis, for that wonderful rendition. In addition to the wonderful members of the Wagner community that are here today, we have a few special guests that I would like to welcome this evening. Chief Jean Rubino, Chief of Detectives for the Hudson County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. <laughs> Chief Donna Jones, uh, yeah, Donna Jones, Deputy Chief of Patrol for Staten Island. <laughs> Beth and Henry Cruz, <laughs> alums and former MLK Agent of Change Award winners. and members of the St. John University's Black Student Union. We would also like to welcome Mr. Burt Gibson, friend and husband and partner of Dr. Gibson, and that, as well as Dr. Erica Gibson, daughter and veterinarian and neuro, neuro, neurologist and neurosurgeon of veterinary science. As everyone knows, to have a successful event, it takes a village. And so a word of thanks to Letty Romero, Rada Abbasing, Gloria Malchiato, and Giortano, and all of the community leaders for their help with putting the logistics of tonight together. And now it is my distinct honor to introduce you to 
of one of Wagner's uncommon leaders, Miracle Nwogu. Miracle is a junior nursing major originally from Anambra uh, State in south southeastern Nigeria. She's an active member of the Black Student Union, a lead mentor for students of color, a community leader, a <laughs> member of the Women of Color Dialogue Circle, and an award-winning sprinter on our track and field team. That's right. And tonight, she will be presenting a piece entitled Rosa Parks by Dr. Nikki Giovanni. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm going to be presenting this piece by Nikki Giovanni called Rosa Parks. This is for the poem and portals, who organized and people say they couldn't and carried the Pittsburgh Courier and Chicago Defenders to the black Americans in the South so that they would know that they were not alone. This is for the Pullman Purtles, who helped Thurgood Marshall go South and come back enough to fight the fight that resulted in the Brown versus the Board of Education. Because even though Kansas is West, and even though Topeka is the breakfast of Gwendolyn Brooks, who wrote the powerful, the Chicago Defenders sent the men to Little Rock. It was the Pullman portals who were supposed to the travel men, both the blues men, and the race men, so that they both would know what was going on. This is for the Pullman portals who smiled and said they were happy and laughed like they were tickled when some folks were around, and who silently rejoiced in the 1954, when the Supreme Court made a, a decision that separate is inherently unequal. This is for the Pullman Purtles who smiled and welcomed the 14-year-old boy onto their train in 1955. They noticed his flat limb that he tried to disguise with a blue up walk. They noticed his stutters and probably understood why his mother had brought him out of Chicago during the summer when school was out. 14-year-old black boys with limbs and stutters that aimed to try to put himself in dangerous ways when their mothers were the ones to look after them. So this is for the Pullman Purtles who looked over that 14-year-old boy while the train rolled the reverse of the Blues Highway from Chicago to St. Louis to Memphis to Mississippi. This is for the men who kept him safe. And if Emmett Till had been able to stay on the train all summer, he would have maybe worn a bit of a pouch, set in the left his hair, probably would have worn bicycle coats and bounced his grandchildren on his knees, telling them about the summer riding right the rail. But he had to get off the train and ended up in Money, Mississippi and was horribly, brutally, inexcusably, and unacceptably mourned. This is for the Pullman Purtles, who when the Sharif was trying to get the body secretly buried, got in its body on the northbound train, got his body home to Chicago where his mother said, I want the world to see what it did to my boy. This is for all the mothers who cried, and this is for all the people who said never again. And this is about Rosa Parks, whose feet were not so tired it had been, after all, an ordinary day until the bus driver gave her the opportunity to make history. This is about Ms. Rosa Parks from Turkey, Alabama, who was also the field secretary of the NAACP. This is about the moment Ms. Rosa Parks shouldered her crust, put her worldly goods aside, and was willing to sacrifice her life so that that young man in money, Mississippi, who had been so well protected by the Pullman Brothers would not have died in vain. When Miss Park said no, a passionate movement was begun. No longer would there be a reliance on the Lord, there was a higher Lord. When Miss Park brought the light of hearts to expose the evil of the system, the sun, break, the sun came and rested on her shoulders, bringing the heat and the light of truth. Although would follow Miss Park, four young men in Greensboro, North Carolina, would also say no. Great forces who were raising the presence of God and exalting us to forgive those who trespass against us. But it was the poor man Purtles who safely got Emmett to his grand uncle. And it was Miss Rosa Parks who could not stand that death. And in not being able to stand it, she sat back down. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. I am Curtis Wright and I get to be the Dean of Campus Life and the Chief Diversity Officer here at Wagner College. 
And I say that because it is indeed an honor and a joy and a gift. Tonight, we get to recognize some really, really phenomenal people. And I am excited because we don't always do this, right? We get so busy, we get so um, connected to our phones and to all the different things in this world that we don't pause to say, good job. And I will let you know right now that I am celebrating um, the Linton season and my sacrifice this year. <laughs> now, you may not believe this, but since 1993, I have not had a piece of meat in my life. I said, I'm not going to do this since 1993. And so I am now giving up eggs and cheese and dairy. I am, I am going vegan. And if I fall out before I finish talking, it is because I need a slice of cheese. <laughs> if there's a brownie out there I can't have either, just bring it in, wave it in front of me, and then maybe that will bring me too. But on Tuesday, we celebrated Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras, and I, it brought me back to 1993. I was a senior in high school. What? Well, it was 94. And I was a young, I was a young, young senior. And I was, I was, I was selected the Mardi Gras king. And I, I'll, I'll let you know, it wasn't like a beauty contest, although I believe at that time I probably would have won that as well. Yes. It was a traditional team contest where you go, they have these cakes set up, and you get to pick a cake, and the cake with the baby in it, you become the king. Now I'm sharing this with you because I know that you all are keep my secret, and, but it's Lent, so I have to sacrifice them and, and, and tell my, my, my sins. So, <laughs> Stephanie Husband and I sat in the back of the room. We stuck our fingers in all the cupcakes until we found the cupcake with the babies in it. So I didn't actually win. I cheated, I but I got my crown. I got to be in the yearbook. And, and at the end of the day, you know, it was, it was phenomenal. I felt good about myself. And I tell you that because every now and again, we find ourselves rewarding people and celebrating people who that's about all they've done. They walked in the back of the room when no one else is looking, they stuck their finger in something, they came out and said, look at me, and we cheer. But those are not the people that we're celebrating tonight. We are celebrating people who, like Nikki Giovanni described, were Pullman porters, right? They stood at the front, they welcomed people in, they smiled, as, as Miracle told us, um, and laughed when people thought they didn't know what was going on, so that other people would have safe passage. So tonight, we are excited to be able to recognize Three phenomenal people, and I'm going to begin by asking Sadiq Sulman to come up to present our first recipient. Thank you, Dean Wright. Good evening, everybody. You all look good tonight, I just want to acknowledge that. So Kayla Till is a junior biology major who's planning to pursue a career in, dent uh, in dentistry. She's a student who's not only passionate about the sciences, but she's also uh, passionate about diversity and equity for minority students. She's an active member of the Wagner community, which is evident in her many endeavors on campus. Uh, she's a dedicated member of the Black Student Union, and currently serving as a community leader for residential education, as well as a program assistant for the LEAD Academy. Uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, um, I am honored to present the 2018 Student MLK Agent of Change Award to Kayla Tim. all the time and he said it's not just me it's everybody who's going through the same thing but 
I look out on all these faces. Get it together. <laughs> <laughs> and I see people that has constantly supported me. I cry like my mom. <laughs> she cried right now. <laughs> but I have my parents, my sisters, Dr. Blaze, Kimani, Quincy, Brandon, so many names that I can say right now. And you guys have been, get yourself together, bro. <laughs> you guys have been a constant helper for me for whatever I'm going through. And this is not just my award. This is your award, too. Dr. Blaze is already receiving his. <laughs> but um, you guys have helped me do so much, whether it be emotional, whether it be academic. And I'm, look, I'm looking at Letty. And I was in her office last week, breaking death. But she had words of wisdom when nobody else could get it to her. And she knows I go back to the back in the seat case. I was like, Letty, you got some time? <laughs> and she says, yeah, I got time for you, even though I know she's busy. And she has constantly supported me. And I'm so thankful for all of you because I walk on these campus, on the campus streets, not these streets, they're actually <laughs> cobblestone roads. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard because I feel very lonely, you know. I'm constantly moving, 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 tired. If you saw me earlier today, you're like, What's, are you okay? <laughs> but um, being here just restores me and knows that I have family, like I have people. Um, so I'm just so thankful for you all. This is not my work. This is all Because I couldn't do this without you. I still don't know how I got here. I thought I was coming into college. I'm just going to go into college and just get my degree and be out of here. But, you know, me being me, I can't just get my degree and leave. I have to do something, but that wouldn't have been possible without all of you. So I thank you so much. Thank you, Taylor. Now, see, when we were doing the flower arrangements, I, I said to Lady, you have to take them home because if you don't, then I, I am allergic to the point where I can't breathe, and I'm already beginning to feel my allergies acting up. So if I begin to cry, it's not that I'm sad, it's just that you know, <laughs> the allergy, the pollen is being turned. But I'd like to now present Dr. Chris Cuovo, who will uh, present our next award this evening. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. I'm glad to be here tonight to help uh, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Jonathan Blaze, receive this award. I met Dr. Blaze when we were both graduate students at the City University of New York, and I can tell that his true passion is STEM education. As a student, as an agent of change, Dr. Blaze works tirelessly not to help students become scholars, but to become students who are individuals that have a presence in their field and in their community. You know, I've known Dr. Blaze for over a decade. We've taught many classes together at two separate institutions. And that's not why I know him as well as I do. We were talking about this earlier. We actually did a calculation. <laughs> <laughs> so over four years, five days a week, um, give or take, you know, you know, a couple of trying to be healthier, we probably ordered yum yum Chinese food <laughs> about a thousand times <laughs> over our education. And it was through that, through the conversations that we would have over lunch, that I could see who Jonathan Blaze really, really is. And he truly is an agent of change. Even last night, working with his seniors, having a spot of pizza while they waited an hour for a gel to run at 8.30 in the evening for lab. <laughs> Just talking about science, career paths, maybe their favorite cars and sometimes. <laughs> and it's, it's for these reasons, it's these individual moments that he spends with all of his students that are so meaningful. So, Dr. Blaze, congratulations. You truly are an agent of change and a positive force for our students. Thank you, Dr. 
formal uh, looking at this picture and hoping I'm not wearing this <laughs> and uh, thank you for those warm comments. You know, they mean a lot. And I'm not sure we ordered a lot of dumplings. <laughs> My cholesterol certainly hasn't recovered since then. <laughs> but they were fun times, and I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I generally don't do this. I try to avoid this. And I tell my students not to prepare documents like this, but I didn't want to miss something. And so, minus five for me on Monday. Okay. <laughs> uh, so it goes without saying that I'd like to thank the organizers of this event for bestowing such an incredible honor upon me, and one that I'm truly honored to receive. Anytime your name is mentioned in the same sentence as Dr. King, you begin to think about your contributions and your vision and your legacy. Uh, to be someone that brings about change, you know, it's something we can all aspire to be or to achieve. It calls for reflection, and to be honest, I was surprised when I saw the email announcing that I had been selected to receive such an honor. Now, it's easy to see why Kayla, a young, talented, incredibly smart, incredibly compassionate, and incredibly active young woman on campus would be selected. Mm -hmm. Easy. It's equally easy to see how Chief Keith would be selected. Not only is he a sterling representative of the Wagner family, he's also a sterling representative of law enforcement and law enforcement community at a time when the country needs it the most. Mm -hmm. I know there are several law enforcement officials in the audience tonight, and I certainly thank you for your service. My brother's a retired and be detective, and it's a tough job. To use his words, as someone who does his job in the spirit of service, not obligation or adventure. And that was clear from just a few moments speaking, which has been immortalized on the cover of the <laughs> <laughs> We need more folks like him. Mm -hmm. uh, but me, Johnny Blaze, right? <laughs> what, what have I done to deserve such an honor, right? Fantastic name notwithstanding. <laughs> sure, I've, I've taught a few courses and I've so thrown some ideas against the laboratory walls to see what sticks. Usually it doesn't. Sometimes it does. Uh, friends, close colleagues, my beautiful wife who couldn't be with us tonight, uh, they would characterize me as someone who is pathologically a creature of habit, or a pathological creature of habit. <laughs> and that's generous, and they'd be right. See, Change and I live on different streets, and we keep to ourselves, and we like it that way. We're not Facebook friends. <laughs> it's the way it has to be for me, at least. And so why would I be honored tonight? How can I get so lucky? Well, in all this, I took a note of the change makers. Those like Dr. King, who sacrifices enabled freedoms that endure even in the darkest hours of the darkest days. Freedoms that we all take for granted, though divisive times remind us of their importance. His contributions would have fallen flat if he abandoned his ideals. It was his refusal to give up on his dream that made change possible. This rings true when you refuse to give up your seat on a bus because of some unjust law. But when you exercise your constitutionally protected freedom of speech in a nonviolent way that the public deems unfit. But when you marry the love of your life, even though it's illegal because of the differences in the color of your skin, my parents. And then when they vandalize your home because they don't approve of an interracial marriage. Or when you try to show the world that it actually might be round and that we may revolve around the sun and not the other way. Or that there might be something to this common ancestor thing and that the ties that bind us far outnumber those that make us different. Or climate change, uh, you get the idea. <laughs> not tonight, all right? And so I really like the juxtaposition of where my thoughts were headed. The paradoxical nature of these thoughts piqued my interest and I said, well, it's funny, deep change, not change for our time, but change for all time requires one to be steadfast in the face of adversaries. It's a compelling idea. It's almost seductive. And it's dangerous. History has shown us too many times how strict adherence to a single ideology can ignite a destructive flame. And in an age of instantaneous accessibility, things like confirmation bias rear its ugly head and make a dangerous problem even worse. And so, how could one know when to be steadfast? when to yield. If change requires stick to how can we be sure that the change we seek is good change? Well, clearly it's a matter of perspective. And where do we gather this perspective? 
And while I've got love for chance, <laughs> I think it's right here. I think it's through education and experience and exposure. It's through these things that we build a comprehensive perspective from the singular views that surround us. It is upon these pillars that Wagner College and other institutions like it build upon. When we willingly place ourselves in unfamiliar, uncomfortable situations and have the patience to consider something other than what we think we know, we afford ourselves the opportunity to evolve. This process is often painful, but to quote the French biologist, surgeon, and Nobel laureate, Dr. Alexis Carroll, man cannot remake himself without suffering, for he is both the marble and the sculptor. This transformation is the magic that happens in the classroom. If I may be so bold, this magic is fortified by the scientific method. And through this coupling that we can approximate objective truth in unparalleled ways. Of course, I am a tad biased, <laughs> but I welcome you to change my mind. In these magic times, change is real. And in these moments of suffering, we become the people who know right from wrong, when to yield and when, uh, when not to. So, to the students with us tonight, and to those who will never hear these words, it is as your professor that I have witnessed a metamorphosis of people whose actions will resonate for centuries. These actions born of beliefs that you forged before my eyes. Beliefs that I hope to have shaped in some way. You enable future change by embracing change now. That I am an agent of change tonight is a direct reflection of you being agents of change every time you step into a classroom and let us as a faculty present a different perspective. Not because you have to, but because you want to. We should all continue to change the world. There is much to do. And know that any success that I have is because of you. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Thank you. So many great things, but there are two that serve as home. This paper, the women of color that so follow, so with that lady, the, the lady runs, and the men of, and the black Latino like initiative that Sadiq runs every Thursday with her ties and scarves. So if you would like a tie or a scarf, they're over there, and they generous alums, faculty, staff, other students have donated ties and alums for this cause, and so and scarves rather right, this cause. So please take one. Um, I'd like to now bring up Kamani Howard, who was the last year's recipient of this award and was our um, leader on the horizon and the president of the Black Student Union. Good evening, everyone. This evening is a celebration of civic duty and a reminder of the importance we have to continue our fight for justice. An agent of change is a person who empathizes self-improvement, not in a selfish sense, but with understanding that we are all working towards the greater good of a larger community. Within the last few months, Mr. Stiff has committed genuine time and energy into nurturing the nest that nurtured him in his inspiring career. In honor of Dr. Cream, it is easy to reflect on his vision without acknowledging the people who put, work, who put the dirty work in like Mr. Stiff. He has been compassionately and morally dedicated to serving his community. Before coming to Deputy Chief of Detectives for the Hudson County Prosecutor's Office, and charting history as the highest ranking black law enforcement executive within his county. Mr. Stiff was a student at Ryder College where he studied sociology. Keith is a proud brother of Sigma Phi Rope Attorney Incorporated, which was found on this very campus. With his busy schedule in national, and being a national president of Sigma Phi Rope, he has managed to find his way back to this campus nearly 30 years later. As a former recipient of this award and current president of the Black Student Union, I have been beyond blessed to see the exact energy and dedication that agents of change embody while pushing for change. Right before I went to research, he offered to conduct a workshop called Do You Know Your Rights? Mm -hmm. this, is a work, this workshop allowed us to have an understanding and clarity on how to interact with law enforcement, especially as an African American when pulled over in a vehicle. It is easy to find interest in a problem when it directly affects you, but it takes a special kind of person to dedicate his Sunday to teach the law when you are a chief deputy within a prosecutor's office. I have been here long enough to be able to differentiate, I'm sorry, I have been here long enough to differentiate lukewarm enthusiasm 
with sincerity in his work. And because of this, I am really honored to present this award to Mr. Keith Stiff. for those kind, kind words. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's always good to come back on campus. Uh, I played on that football field 32 years ago. I still got one more hit in me. <laughs> <laughs> one more hit in me. But um, I am both honored and excited to uh, receive the Martin Luther King Agent of Change Award. I want to thank uh, Curtis and those who nominated and selected me for the award. I also want to uh, congratulate uh, my fellow nominees. Uh, your recognition is well deserved. Before I say anything else, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, my boss, Prosecutor Esther Suarez. Mm -hmm. I'm going to embarrass her for about 10 seconds, but she served with distinction too. She's the first woman and Hispanic prosecutor in Hudson County. So, uh, In the spirit of Dr. King, uh, this board validates the importance of, of service and giving back to the next generation of leaders. Uh, even though, Curtis, I am grateful for this award, I'm also mindful that this award, this award is a tribute to the efforts of you and, yeah. and your staff of uh, reaching out to African American alumni, having them come back to campus to share their time and talent. So thank you. Closing, um, uh, I made a commitment to Curtis to, to spend a lot of time up here at Wagner, so uh, get used to seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> went somewhere. And, and I'm not quite sure where she, she wandered off to, but I will, I will fill the time while she's out. Um, <laughs> next Thursday, um, so a week from today, we are going to be hosting our annual Black Scholar um, Lecture Series featuring two amazingly talented scholars. Dr. Stephen Perry is a nationally renowned educator. He opened four charter schools in, in, um, in Connecticut. And his goal is to expand access to education, particularly for the least among us. So he works with the black and brown communities, and his students graduate. 100% of them go to college. Um, and people are wondering, what is his secret? Um, and he's going to tell us that next week. Additionally, our LMAT panelist, Dr. Nadia Lopez, she was a grad undergraduate here. She did her, her bachelor's degree in nursing. She went off to um, graduate and said, I don't necessarily want to be a nurse, but I want to change the world. And she had this idea, if I can open a school, I'll close a prison. So she created this school in Brooklyn called the Mott Haven School. And you probably, my Academy rather, you probably may have, if you follow Humans of New York, one of her kids was, beach, was asked a question, who was the most important person to you? And he said, my principal, Dr. or Miss Lopez at the time. And so she, that, the man who interviewed him was so captured by him that he wanted to meet her. And they did a social media campaign that raised a million dollars in mm -hmm. like 48 hours for that school. And she has been sensational. She actually is in, when we traveling to Salt Lake City and said, you know, I'm, I'm in Salt Lake that day and I really want to be there, so can I Skype with you? And I said, sure. The borough president is naming that day the Nadia Lopez Day. So she's getting on the plane in the morning, flying to Staten Island mm -hmm. to be at this event, and then flying back. We have to get her right back to the airport because she's got to be back in the morning for a presentation that she's doing because she's that much committed to Wagner, and she recognizes the good work that, that we all are doing. So if you are on campus, it will be at 430 in Sparrow 2. So please stop by. I, I promise you it will be a treat. Each of our award recipients receive not only the plaque but a book. You too can have one of those books. I'm not quite sure of the exact price, but it's Dr. <laughs> it's Dr. Gibbs's memoir, and they are located right outside. But um, Lady's going to be talking to us in a second. Do you see Lady? Travis. Lady. 
Oh, I'm sorry, Letty. She just sat there. <laughs> see, so Letty keeps Letty. me together. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and she truly is, as, as Kayla said, our, 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 our rock, the gem that hides in, the, in, in, her, in her office, but, but keeps us all moving. So Letty, please come. World Peace Rose Gardens program is a worldwide effort to help youth recognize the importance and value of peace. In March 1992, the Martin Luther King Jr. I Have a Dream World Peace Rose Garden was planted at the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Site. The garden is an artistic interpretation of Dr. King's life and ideals of peace through nonviolence. The garden's starburst design brings attention to the brilliance of Dr. King's ideals using the official flower of the United States, the rose. Here to my right, we are displaying a representation of those gardens. Let me share the meaning of the design to you all. The starburst, starburst design reminds us of the brilliance of Dr. King's life and the impact of his ideals on humankind. The white roses honor the special bond and similarity of peace movements between Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi. The Red Roses honor all African Americans and their contributions to the history of the United States and the world. The Pink Roses represent Mrs. Coretta Scott King's oneness with Dr. King and her, con and her continuation of his work. The various clusters of multicolored flowers symbolize the nations of the world and the universal appeal of Martin Luther King Jr.'s message of peace through nonviolence. I feel that I don't die of, of, of allergies. At the end of the evening, we're going to ask that each of the recipients take one of the vases of roses with them as another moment for tonight. And it brings me great pleasure to bring my friend and our colleague, Professor Anthony Turner, to introduce our keynote speaker. Right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, my name is Anthony Turner. I am adjunct professor of voice in the music department here at Wagner College. And, behalf, and on behalf of Wagner College, it is my distinct honor to introduce the 2018 MLK Agent of Change keynote speaker, Dr. Nell Braxton Gibson. Dr. Gibson's decades-long commitment to righting societal wrongs and standing up against social injustice has garnered her worldwide recognition. I have had the pleasure of hearing Dr. Gibson lecture on her experiences as a freedom fighter during the Civil Rights Movement and was riveted by the retelling of her life in her book entitled, Too Proud to Bend, journey of a civil rights foot soldier. Dr. Gibson takes us on a journey from her youth as the daughter of educators in the Jim Crow South to her associations with leading civil rights icons such as Medgar Evers, Mary McLeo <coughs> Dacoon, her endearing friendship with Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, and as an invited guest to the pre-inaugural ball of President Barack Obama. Dr. Gibson's numerous awards and honors include, and some of those are in tonight's program, she was the first woman to serve on the Board of Trustees, Berkeley Divinity School at Yale University, awarded an honorary Doctor of Divinity degree from Yale University for her work in bringing more women and people of color onto the Board of Trustees. She is listed in Who's Who Among African Americans, she has been presented with the National Union of Black Episcopalians President's Award for alleviating oppression throughout the African diaspora. Awarded the Trinity Transformational Fellowship for her social justice work, allowing Dr. Gibson to spend time in South Africa and Namibia gathering information on the bloodless transition of both countries from apartheid to independence. She has been honored as a distinguished alumna of Empire State College. 
She received the Bishop's Cross from the Episcopal Diocese of New York for her social justice work. She has been featured in the New York Daily News article, Unsung Heroes of Civil Rights. And she has been a featured guest on the segment, Samantha Bee's Black History Minute, on the TBS show, Full Frontal with Samantha Bee. In addition, Dr. Gibson's efforts to end social injustice in the United States and Africa resulted in Archbishop Desmond Tutu appointing her to be a member of his steering committee of international religious leaders who helped design a five-year plan to dismantle apartheid. Dr. Gibson has been a member of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in the Bowery in Manhattan for 52 years, where she and her family continue to worship and where we first met in approximately 2006. On a personal note, Mel, Dr. Gibson, when I think of two or three adjectives to describe you and in the short time or the long time that I've known you, the first one is you are a class act. The second is you are a lady. And the third is that you are a trusted friend. We are blessed and graced with your, with your presence on our small liberal arts campus. I present to you Dr. Nell Braxton Gibson. like I shouldn't speak so I don't destroy that beautiful introduction. <laughs> thank you, uh, Anthony, for those beautiful words. And thank you for working so tirelessly over a number of years to bring me here to, to speak at Wagner. And I also want to thank uh, Dean Curtis Wright for working with Dr. Erica Gibson to make sure that this event occur tonight. Um, I'm indebted to you and to the administration for your very kind invitation. I thought I would speak tonight on the legacy of racism in America and its echoes from the 50s and 60s because I, that's what I know best. I'm a child of the South. I spent the first 20 years of my life growing up in the segregated South. But I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the legacy of racism itself because most of us already know it. Mm -hmm. But it's sometimes good to look back and see how the past influences the present. Carter G. Woodson, who's the founder of Black History Month, said in one of his most famous speeches, those who have no knowledge of what their forebears have accomplished lose the inspiration which comes from the teaching of biography and history. In a Washington Post article from December of 2017, one line in the paper jumped out at me. Change cannot happen without knowledge. So maybe tonight, as we look at knowledge from the past and share information from our forebears, a seed for change can be planted. Although, according to the lives of the recipients tonight, um, change, that seed for change has already been planted. I also want to share some of my own legacy of racism through excerpts uh, from my memoir, because Proud of, uh, part of my legacy is the history of this country during some of our most challenging times. To briefly remind us of what we've come through so that we all have the same reference point, let me begin by assuming that all of us know racism in this country began long before any of us came into this world. 
with the arrival of the first white settlers who began to drive Native Americans from their homes on the East Coast, pushing them west as soon as the newcomers discovered the riches the earth had to offer, including gold in the Appalachian Mountains. Some of my ancestors were among those tribes that were pushed westward. Others of my ancestors were snatched from the shores of Africa, chained, forced into the bottom of ships, and having survived the horrendous middle passage, were stripped nearly naked and auctioned off for hard labor before machines were invented to do that kind of backbreaking work. Looking at their dehumanizing sail, it's not hard to imagine and to recognize that the first stock sold on the New York Stock Exchange was slaves. And the legacy of racism continued with many other groups of people who were brought here or who migrated here including the Chinese, who were brought over to do the back-breaking work of building our railroads. Racism manifested itself in the forced removal of Japanese Americans who were detained in concentration camps during World War II. And as new groups arrived, racism and discrimination extended to Irish, Poles, Italians, Jews, and many others. Today, that intolerance extends to Muslims, Latinos, and in the President's words, Haitians, South Americans, and people from bleak old African countries. Racial intolerance is in the President's demand to build a wall along our Mexican border, while he shows support for neo-Nazis and members of Unite the Right organizations, especially those who were gathered in Charlottesville, Virginia, and ended up ramming a car into peaceful protesters and killing one. <coughs> Very fine people, the president called them. Three years ago, the New York Times ran an op-ed piece by Eric Fona, a professor at Columbia University which indicated that some of the issues that agitate America and American politics today can be traced back to questions around Reconstruction. Issues like access to citizenship, <laughs> voting rights, the power of the nation and state governments, the relationship between political an economic democracy and a proper response to terrorism. These were the issues surrounding the first Reconstruction after slavery. Do you hear any echoes? Access to citizenship? Dreams, perhaps? Voting rights? How about redistricting <clears throat> and redlining during the last election? A response to terrorism. Does banning Muslims and turning them back at airports ring a bell? <laughs> These were the issues surrounding the first Reconstruction, and they are the issues we still live with today as we lean toward the third Reconstruction. During the first Reconstruction, Southerners who lost the Civil War believed that newly freed African Americans were unfit to exercise their own rights. This portrait of African Americans was popularized in the 1915 film, Birth of a Nation. And I'll be referring to that 1915 film, and I, I will keep saying 1915 because, as some of you probably know, there was a 2016 film about Matt Turner, also called Birth of a Nation. After the Civil War, when President Abraham Lincoln announced a plan to establish government in the South, 
and he wanted to establish those governments that were loyal to the Union. And so he granted amnesty rights to most Confederates as long as they accepted the abolition of slavery. But he didn't say anything about the rights of blacks. Unfortunately, Lincoln did not live long enough to preside over Reconstruction. So his successor, Andrew Johnson, was left with the task. By all accounts, Johnson was an incorrigible racist, willing to, unwilling to listen to criticism, and unable to work with Congress. Echoes which still ring today. <laughs> After the strides <clears throat> made by President Obama's administration, we again have incorrigible racists, unwilling to listen to criticism, and able <coughs> to work with Congress. Following World War II, and again during the Civil Rights era, which is considered to be the second Reconstruction, the same kinds of discrimination against African Americans prevailed, with the end results in all those cases being racial terrorism and an unprecedented lynching of blacks, especially young black men. In each instant, racists took their cue from that 1915 Birth of a Nation film, whether they saw the film or not. And I'll expand on that in a few minutes. My own first experience with racism occurred in the 1940s, when my parents and I escaped a race riot in Beaumont, Texas. And I'd like to share a portion of that experience from my memoir. Veiled in a mist of fog and confusion, I hold tightly to my mother's hand as we make our way along the crowded street. My father walks ahead of us in the dark carrying suitcases. We move past Negro homes, which is what we were called back then, where people are throwing buckets of water on flames, leaping from the roofs of houses. People are screaming and crying and using garden hoses on patches of burning grass. <clears throat> Despite my mother's calm, I sense fear. Babies are crying and women are sobbing softly. So I can tell this night is unusual. Families beside us have loaded what they could salvage onto flatbed trucks and the tops of cars, sofas, chairs, radios, mattresses, suitcases, lamps, and fans are all tied down with rope and cord. Older people and women with babies ride inside the truck cabs as the exodus of Negroes surges forward. Street lights cast shadows on the road. When we approach the outskirts of town, my father spots a large black sedan idling in the distance, and the three of us go to it. He climbs into the front seat. Mother and I step onto the running board and settle down in the back. The windows are rolled up, making the air inside steamy and difficult to breathe. For many years, I had a recurring nightmare about that. I had no idea it was something I had lived through. But from the time I was a very small child up to my late 30s, I had this recurring nightmare. One year, my parents were visiting us in New York from California. And I asked my mother if anything like that had ever happened to us. And she kind of staggered back and her mouth fell open. And she looked at me and she said, you were only 14 months old. What you are describing is the Beaumont race riot. The Beaumont, Texas race riot can also be traced back 
to that 1915 version of Birth of a Nation, which prominently features the fear of the rape of virtuous white women by savage black men as the reason for stalking and torturing and lynching blacks. Beaumont, Texas was the city to which my parents had moved two years after they were married. <coughs> so my father could accept a better paying job than the one he'd left behind in Georgia. But the city in which they had placed their hopes exploded the night a white woman claimed she was raped by a Negro shipyard worker. Based on her accusation, the police rounded up Negro men at random and threw them into jail. Later, under FBI interrogation, the woman admitted to having lied. But her initial claim had caused a Negro worker in an all-night ice stand to be shot and killed by whites in a passing car and had led to mass disorder throughout the city. Under further investigation, the underlying cause of the violence was revealed to have stemmed from the hiring of Negro shipyard workers who performed technical skills that commanded good pay, while white workers lacking those skills were relegated to lower paying jobs. Their anger over the hiring of Negroes for the better jobs boiled over when rumor of a rape of a white woman spread through the city. I learned later that Beaumont wasn't the only city that experienced a race riot during the summer of 1943. Negro-white relations were shaky all across the country, where tensions and fear gave way to distrust between the races. The new status among Negroes based on their having been trained in government service jobs during World War II had grown from 60,000 to 300,000 hires between 1940 and 1944, and that had caused deep resentment among whites in the South as well as the North. <coughs> among the riots that took place that summer were the, an outbreak in Harlem and two in Detroit, the first of which occurred in June. And of course, that was the same summer of the Zoop Zoop riots in Los Angeles, California. Here again we see that the advancement of African Americans and the anger surrounding that advancement among disgruntled whites, how it led to violence against blacks. Moving from World War II to the dawning of the Civil Rights era, I find myself at the second incident of racism which left an indelible imprint on me similar to that of the Beaumont race riot. It was the murder of Emmett Till when I was 13 years old. My mother, father, sister, and I lived about 60 miles from where Till was lynched in Muddy, Mississippi. And it was the most terrifying murder I had heard of. I think part of the terror came from the fact that I had never before heard of a child being murdered in an act of racism, and because his murder was so very, very brutal. In the 1950s, it was young men 18 years or <coughs> older who were being lynched, not 14-year-olds. Unfortunately, the murder of even younger children, children has become um, almost all too common today. Children like 12-year-old Tamir Rice. But in the 1950s, it was not common for young children to be killed, and especially not in the way that he was. All that changed when he was lynched. Amid his cries for his mother and calls for God's mercy, a mob of white southern vigilantes forced their way into his uncle's cabin, pulled the boy out of bed, 
threw him into the back seat of their car, beat him mercilessly, then drove down to the Tallahatchie River. There they forced him out of the vehicle, made him carry a 75-pound cotton gin fan down to the riverbank, and then strip naked. They tortured him, shot him in the head, crushed his skull, gouged out an eye, and tied his body to the cotton gin fan with barbed wire before dumping it in the river. Days later, when investigators pulled his corpse up, it was so badly mutilated that his uncle knows right could only identify him by an initial ring his nephew wore. The boy's casket was sent by train to his mother in Chicago, who collapsed on the station platform when she saw the remains of her only child. She decided to leave the casket open so the rest of the world could see what had been done to him. Professor Sally Avery Bermanzan, who taught in the political science department at Brooklyn College, wrote in a November 1st, 2000 volume of New Political Science that violence was central to politics during the civil rights era in the United States. She says the criminal justice system from the local to the federal government punished very few of these racial crimes. And that the tradition of lynching cannot and could not exist without the complicity of the authorities. She said that the local and state officials, including the police, jailers, mayors, and others, often facilitated and certainly did nothing to impede racist mobs. Sadly, the same can be said today. Mm -hmm. In 1954, when the Supreme Court voted in Brown versus Board of Ed to have all white schools across the country integrated, Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, became a lightning rod in 1957. Angry mobs gather outside the school to scream <coughs> racial slurs and throw things at the nine African-American students who tried to enter the school. The mayor of Little Rock, as well as Governor Orville Forbes, were completely against the integration of Central High School and did nothing to prevent what was taking place outside that school. President Dwight D. Eisenhower's response was to refuse to send federal troops into Arkansas to protect the Negro students, claiming he was president of all the people, meaning the white racists as well as the Negroes and others, and not wanting a confrontation with Governor Forbes, he refused to take sides in the desegregation battle, saying he would never send federal troops to enforce orders of the federal court. It was not until outside observers began to lay blame for the crisis that was developing between angry whites and the nine black students from the president, and when Thurgood Marshall spoke up saying the president had to move to keep things from getting out of hand, that the mayor of Little Rock asked the Justice Department to step in. Eisenhower, still loath to intervene, was finally forced to send the 101st Airborne in to enforce the Supreme Court decision. Going back to Carter G. Woodson's statement that those who have no knowledge of what their forebears have accomplished lose the inspiration that comes from the teaching of history causes me to remember how during the days of segregation, all Southern black children were tutored by the entire black community of which we were a part. 
we were taught the contributions of our ancestors so that we could have the advantages we had during our time. And even though we lived under segregated conditions, we felt lucky to have had the opportunity to learn when we discovered that Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, who was a friend of our parents and grandparents, had had such a difficult time in learning to read. When she was nine years old, she told my sister and me of an experience she had that changed her life. She and her mother went to deliver clothes to the white folk who had owned the McLeods during slavery. During that trip, young Mary McLeod stopped at the playhouse of the child her mother ironed clothes for in order to play with the two little white girls inside. Rocking one of the dolls she had been handed, young Mary picked up a book to look at. As soon as she touched it, one of the little girls yelled, put down that book, you can't read. The white child was confident in her assertion, Mrs. Bethune told us, because slavery, which outlawed teaching Negroes to read and write, had not been overlawed. Embarrassed by the sudden outburst, Mary McLeod put the book down. She said she had only picked it up out of curiosity. But as she returned it to the table, she promised herself that one day she would learn to read and she would teach other members of her race to read too. So no one would ever again tell a Negro child to put down a book. As she came of age, Mary McLeod Bethune became especially concerned about young girls like herself who were denied an education. That concern pushed her to build a school in the South where she said the need was greatest. She wanted the school to be in an inexpensive neighborhood because she had no money. The rest, she says, she left to God. During her early teaching days in Florida, some people directed her to a piece of land and a dilapidated house that she could rent for $200, $5 down, and the balance within two years. The owner of the land said the place was a public dump heap, but he agreed to sell it to her. He never knew it, but I didn't have the five dollars she confided to her biographers. I promised to be back in a few days with the initial payment, which I raised selling ice cream and sweet potato pies to work with on construction jobs. I took the owner his money in a small change wrapped in my handkerchief. She said the most intangible asset in starting her school was her partnership with God. I believe in God, and so I believe in Mary Bethune. Mm -hmm. The school that she started became Bethune-Cookman College in Daytona Beach, Florida, and is still going strong today. Just as Mary McLeod Bethune created a way to educate young people, she impressed upon my sister and me the need for our generation to create avenues for learning and advancement for children who came after us. <laughs> And at that time, we were seven and nine years old. And she was having very serious conversations with us about what we should do. It would be 10 years before I had a chance to act on the promise my sister and I made to Dr. Bethune to make the world a better place. By that time, I had learned of the death of a little black toddler in Atlanta, where I was in school at Spelman College. This little boy had gotten very sick, and Grady Memorial Hospital at that time was a public hospital. So she had taken the baby to Grady Memorial. She walked into the black emergency room, which was packed, and she realized it was going to be a long time before her baby was seen. 
But she could see into the white emergency room on the other side, and there was nobody in there. So she ran around the building to the white side and ran into the receptionist and begged her to call a doctor to take care of the baby. The receptionist sent her back to the Negro side, told her she was in the wrong place. Subsequent to that, the baby died. After learning of his death, I began to question whether or not I would start to expose myself along with other college students to getting arrested and or sent to jail on behalf of people like that little boy and others. <clears throat> and considering my decision, I reflected back on my promise to Dr. Mary McCloud Bethune. Tonight, as we look at the echoes from the past, let us also remember that not all echoes of the past were negative. Not all deal with lynching and assassination and overt racism. Some of the echoes are positive. Just as the modern civil rights movement began with the death of Emmett Till, today's Black Lives Matter movement began with the death of Trayvon. Martin. And it sparked other movements. We the protesters was organized after the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson. And there are the dream defenders and showing up for racial justice. Move on and many others. On May 13th of this year, Reverend William Barber is stepping down as president of the North Carolina NAACP in order to lead what he has called the Third Reconstruction. He plans to start it beginning with the Second Poor People's Campaign. Now, I'm looking around this room, and I know many of you are way too young to remember the Poor People's Campaign of 1968. But let me tell you, that Poor People's Campaign was the last initiative of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. In it, he planned to demand that President Lyndon Johnson and Congress help support jobs for the poor as well as health care and housing. But King was assassinated a few weeks before the campaign could take place. And so his widow, Coretta Scott King, and his associates, Reverend Ralph Abernathy and Reverend Jesse Jackson, along with a host of other ministers, led the march on May 12th in 1968. A week after that march, protesters erected tents and shacks near the foot of the Lincoln Memorial, and they called the area Resurrection City. While they were still recovering from the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., which had occurred a month earlier, presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy, brother of the late President John F. Kennedy, was himself assassinated, and the heart of the poor people's campaign seemed to die with those two assassinations in 1968. And the heart of protesting appeared to die as well. But you know, when we consider echoes from the past, and when we have knowledge of our past, as Carter G. Woodson reminded us, we understand that the past can be changed. Some of those echoes, as I said, are positive ones. Some are about change for the better. We have changed the course of history in the past, and we can do it again. A friend of mine from my civil rights days sent me an email in 2008 when President Obama was elected. In it, he said, recently I was asked to speak at an Obama rally as a representative from the student movement. Just before I got up to speak, they showed a movie about Obama, followed by a movie about the movement. They showed the people who gave their last full measure of devotion. Then I spoke. Now I broke and started crying before I regained my composure. I was emotionally trained as I remembered what we did and who did it. People like Frank Smith, Big Frank Holloway, Anna Jo Weaver, Elizabeth Heath, 
Ralph Moore, Larry Fox, Gwen Isles, Ruby Doris Smith, Leo Meadows, and these were groups of black and white students in Atlanta, <coughs> you, me, and thousands of others. We changed history. And so tonight I challenge you, as Dr. Bethune challenged my sister and me. And I ask you, what is your legacy for future generations? What will you do to make this country and this world better? What positive echo will you leave from this generation? Thank you. ways that we can, can change that and to, to add a ripple. And one person that's really making ripples throughout this, this city is one of our alums, Mr. Courtney Bennett, who's the executive director for 100 Black Men. Just so I want to make sure we welcome Dr. Mr. Bennett. Thank you for being here. Another amazing agent of change is our senior vice president, our provost, um, Dr. Luther Neer, who provide us with some closing Thank you so much, Dean Light and Ms. Letty Romero for playing such a spectacular Agent of Change Award ceremony. Each of our recipients today exemplify what I would like to describe in a, poem, in a quote written by Martin Luther King Jr. in his letter from a Birmingham jail. And I would also like to give honor to our keynote speaker, Dr. Nell Braxton, Gibson, who reminds us that the echoes of hope and change are here with us each and every day, and that we are all so closely tied to the lives of each other and in making this world a better place for all. Dr. King writes, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an escapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. And each of our recipients here today and our keynote speaker demonstrate that day in, day out. I can't tell you how proud I am of all of you. Kayla Teal, Dr. Jonathan Blaze, Deputy Chief Keith Stiff, and to our keynote speaker. I'm proud of each and every one of you. I'm proud of all of you here in the audience today. And I would like to echo Dr. Gibson's inexorable quest that we all make a difference and find out what our passion is and make the world better tomorrow than it is today. Thank you again for all of your attention this evening. And I look forward to seeing you next week at our Black Scholars Lecture Ceremony. Take care and thank you all.